Yeah, so we're, we're going to get into uh, this sermon for this morning. We are still moving through Acts, and we are in chapter, I think we're in chapter 18 today, if I'm correct. Yes, chapter 18, that is right. And we are in part 20 of our Acts series, so, you know, we're, we're moving along, and hopefully y'all have learned a lot. Last week, we kind of did a recap, and um, someone commented to me, this is kind of like the flashback episode, you know, last week in a series, you know, it's like, it's like, I always hate those episodes because I'm like, give me something new, you know, it's like y'all are trying to save money on this episode by just flashing back to everything that's already happened, uh, but, uh, but hopefully it was good for you all to be able to review where we've come from, and some of y'all, uh, all of you all had really um, beautiful insights to share, those of you who shared last week. We're going to jump back into the text uh, this morning. So over the past few years as a pastor, one thing I've done more of is weddings. And I love doing weddings. They, they are a lot of work, but they're a lot of fun um, to, to celebrate marriages with folks. And one thing that I always like to remind people of at a wedding, the married couple, but also everybody who's there at the wedding, is that, you know, marriage is, in my opinion, way bigger than just like two people coming together as one. Like that is part of it. That is a big part of it, right? But I think marriage is more than just two people coming together to love each other really well. It's more than that. I think it is, is really about two people coming together. They love one another, but they also share that love with the world, right? It's two people coming together to be a force of good and love and peace in our world. And I think that's what God wants uh, from those who, who take the path of marriage. It's not, just that, it's not just about you and your little family, but really about how can you share that love with the world. And I can't think of a better example of this in our Bibles than a couple that is introduced in chapter 18 of Acts. And this is a couple of Priscilla and Aquila. Have y'all heard of this couple before? Um, this couple is mentioned in Acts, in Romans, in 1 Corinthians, and also in 2 Timothy. So they are mentioned multiple times in the New Testament. And an interesting thing is they're always mentioned together. They're never mentioned separately. And nothing negative is ever said about this couple. They truly are two people who came together to be a force for good in our world. This past week, um, I, was, I told a few people I was preaching on Priscilla and Aquila, and, and a couple of them, do y'all got any thoughts about it? And, and all of them said something along these lines, like, I really don't know anything about them, and I've not thought much about Priscilla and Aquila. Now, the people I ask are people who know things about the Bible. Like, these are not just, like, uh, people who know a little bit. They know a lot about the Bible. Yet they hadn't learned or talked or, or heard much about this couple even when this couple is mentioned in four different books in the Bible. So even when Paul said these words about this couple, look what Paul says about this couple in Romans chapter 16. He said, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. He says, They risk their lives for me. He said, Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful for them. And those are that's really high praise, right, for this couple. They made a profound impact. They risked their lives for Paul. And he says that Paul and all the other churches of the Gentiles are grateful for Priscilla and Aquila. I'll go ahead and tell you one reason I think this couple has not received a whole lot of attention in our churches. There is a strong argument to be made, and we're going to talk about it, that Priscilla the woman in the relationship was actually the more prominent leader in the early church. Now, this is very countercultural and subversive. This was a very subversive and countercultural couple in the ancient world. The ancient world, is, as we've talked about many times, was very male-dominated. Yet, it seems, by all accounts, that Priscilla actually was the, the, the stronger leader and the one who had the more prominent role in the early church. And so you can understand why, you know, in the history of Christianity is one of the negative things about the history of Christianity has been dominated mostly by men. And you can imagine that men don't want to tell the story of Priscilla and Aquila too often because it might be an example that shows that maybe they shouldn't be holding on to their power so tightly and limiting the roles of women 
in the early church. So it's better just not to talk about this woman named Priscilla. But we're going to get into it this morning because we're going through Acts, and this is important, and I think it's something that we need to learn. According to uh, Willie James Jennings, who I've quoted many times throughout this series, he says, Priscilla and Aquila are disciples together, he says, which he argues is the best definition of a Christian couple, that they are disciples together. We're not getting into who's got this role or this role. He's like, no, the best definition is that both of you all are committed to Jesus and you are serving the Lord together as a couple. Two disciples of Jesus came together to be a force for good in the world. And these two people made a very significant impact on many people's lives. And I think without them, I'm not sure that the gospel would have advanced in the way that it did in the first century if it wasn't for these two folks. So what I want to do this morning is piece together some different scriptures about them so that y'all can learn more about this couple and hopefully be challenged and inspired by their story. So, let's begin. So this is our text. Uh, This is from Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 2, and this is how it begins. It says, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. So you remember two weeks ago, Paul was in Athens Now he left Athens and he went to the city of Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila from Pontus who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. So here we're introduced to this couple. Two weeks ago we looked at the story of Paul in Athens. If y'all remember the story, he went to Athens and they had you know, idols everywhere. He was surrounded by idolaters, which is like a no-no for Jewish folks, and you don't worship idols. And so Paul is probably overwhelmed and disgusted by all the idol worship around him. Yet instead of turning away from the idolaters, he turned towards them, and he reached out to them across difference. After his time in Athens ended, he went to Corinth. Now Corinth was a, a, a bustling city. There was a lot going on in Corinth. It was, had lots of culture. It was also known to be a city with lots of po- partying, you know, and like kind of wild living in Corinth. I've heard someone describe that, you know, going from Athens to Corinth could be like going from Oxford to London. You're going from like Oxford, this really like prominent educational city, um, going then to like London, a more metropolitan city where you're going to have lots more going on. Apparently, when Paul got to Corinth, he felt a little uncomfortable there. Um, He told the Corinthians, which is written to the people in Corinth, he told them uh, in 1 Corinthians, he said, I came to you, he's saying, I came to you in Corinth in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And we don't know exactly what's going on there, but Paul went to Corinth, and it seems like he was a bit overwhelmed, maybe even a bit afraid um, from being there in this particular city. Maybe there was some rough stuff going on there. We don't know. But while in Corinth, Paul met a couple there that eased his worries, Priscilla and Aquila. They invited him into their home. They embraced him and helped him feel comfortable in this new place. Priscilla and Aquila were a refugee couple. All right? They were literally a refugee couple in Corinth because they had been forced to leave Rome because it was not safe for them to be there anymore. There was a ban on all Jews in Rome, and they told them they had to leave the city because of some disturbances and things that were going on there. There's a historian named Suetonius that wrote this uh, text called The Life of Claudius, and he mentions what happened um, here. And this is like kind of an extra uh, biblical thing. It's not in the Bible, but it helps support what we're talking about in history. He said these words, Since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Crestus, he, talking about Claudius, expelled them from Rome. Now it's believed that this Crestus he refers to was actually a misspelling and was meant to say Christus, referring to Jesus, Christ. Um, And so talking about that these Jews who were committed to this Christ were causing disturbances, and so they were ended up being kicked out of the city. When we did our Roman series, if y'all remember that, a year ago, um, we talked about this. This because we talked about how um, after there was another emperor and all of them were allowed to go back. And so you had this mix of people who had been kicked out of Rome were coming back. And 
And we talked about this particular thing, if you remember that. But once again, like, it's kind of easy for us as we go through the Bible just to, like, gloss over this. But, like, this is a really horrific thing that happened. And I think we ought to always pause for a moment and acknowledge things like this. The dangerous journey of suffering and and pain that this couple endured. They fled life-threatening conditions in Rome, not by their own choice, but because they were trying to survive. There are so many refugees all across our world that are forced to leave the places that they call home because it's not safe to be there anymore. And I think we need to give our respect and honor to this couple but all refugees across our world and all throughout history who have endured similar circumstances. There are many other refugees throughout Scripture. The Holy Family were literally refugees early in Jesus' life because they had to flee to Egypt because it wasn't safe for them to stay in their homeland. So as we will see, though, God took this really difficult situation for this couple and He brought something good from it. First, They were in Corinth, and because they were in Corinth, they got to meet Paul. And Paul needed Priscilla and Aquila at this moment in his life. It's great because they met one another because they actually shared something in common. They were both tent makers. You may know this about Paul. It talks about how he was a tent maker, and that's how he supported himself often. He would work all throughout the week, and then he would go to the synagogues on the weekend and talk to folks about, you know, Jesus and and sometimes get into arguments with people. Priscilla and Aquila were doing the same thing. They were working throughout the week and then um, helping support and enrich the church on the weekends. They were both tent makers, and they invited Paul to stay in their house with him. So Paul, we know, stayed in Corinth for at least a year and a half, and it it may have been a good bit longer than that. He's making tents during the week and then talking with folks in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And they eventually then left Corinth and went to Ephesus together, these folks. And so this is where we come to this story in the text in in Acts 18. Now, there came to Ephesus a Jew named Apollos from Alexandria. Now, he was an eloquent man, well-versed in the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with burning enthusiasm and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. So here we're introduced to a man named Apollos, all right? And so they went to Ephesus. They were once again in the synagogues. You know, I think it's important to see that even though they had started to reach out mostly to Gentiles at this point, they were still going to the synagogues. This was their place of worship. They were still very much connected to their Jewish faith. And so they were in the synagogue every single week discussing Jesus um, with their fellow Jews and others who were there. And so we're introduced to this man named Apollos. You maybe have heard of Apollos. Um, Some people argue that Apollos may have written the book of Hebrews, actually. Um, We're not quite sure. Uh, But Apollos is mentioned in other places in the New Testament as well. He was a Jew from Alexandria, which is in Egypt. And Alexandria has a reputation for having a lot of really smart people there. There was schools of philosophy there in Alexandria. They were known for training well-educated and gifted philosophers. So Apollos was trained there. So he's a smart guy, all right? He's very intellectual, very smart, says he was eloquent so he could speak really well. He had a lot of passion and enthusiasm for the gospel. Probably a very charismatic guy, connected well with people. And so he was in the synagogue preaching. You know, he probably was preaching a lot, proclaiming Jesus in the gospel. Now, one day, Priscilla and Aquila were in the synagogue, and they were listening to Apollos preach. And they probably were hearing him like, oh, this guy's pretty good. You know, I like what he's saying. But turns out, as they were listening to him, there were some things they heard that either gave them concern or they heard his message, and they're like, he's not really telling the story of Jesus in its fullness, maybe. Or maybe he's... He's saying things that aren't quite in line with what we know about what Jesus was all about. Maybe he's missing some important details. We don't know. But something about what Apollos was saying drew them to approach him after he was preaching 
taking him aside, they likely invited him into their home, showed him hospitality, and it says they taught him about the way of Jesus. Now, this whole scene is very surprising on a few levels. I want to break these down. I'm going to give you three reasons why I think this is surprising. First, that Priscilla and Aquila, first off, felt the freedom and authority to do this. Like, to take Apollos aside and teach him about the way of Jesus. This was a well-respected, popular teacher. This guy had been trained in Alexandria. He was very well respected, I imagine. Priscilla and Aquila were tent makers. They were refugees. They were not trained in these places like Alexandria, yet they felt the freedom and the courage to reach out to Apollos and lovingly bring him more fully into what the gospel was all about. I mean, this is really Um, surprising, and it probably shows that Priscilla and Aquila had a lot of respect in the early church, and perhaps they were already considered leaders um, in many places throughout that area. Another surprising part of the story for me is that Apollos was open to feedback. You know, how many charismatic, well-educated male preachers today are open to feedback on their messages? (laughs) Rick's laughing because he'd been a preacher. He knows how it is. You know, I I think we would be in a better place if a lot of our, our charismatic preachers across our nation and world were more open to feedback, right? And, and sought out that feedback and ask for that feedback. But in my experience, um, it's hard. It's hard for me to want feedback sometimes because it's a vulnerable thing to get up and share. Um, but Apollos was open to that feedback and received that feedback from them. It probably shows how wonderful Priscilla and Aquila were that they approached him in such a way that invited that kind of conversation. The third thing that that is really uh, fascinating to me is not only was he willing to receive feedback, but he was willing to sit under the teaching of a woman. The ancient world was very patriarchal, ruled and dominated by men. Yet, here in the early church, we find an example of a woman teaching a man. I want to show you something interesting. I'm going to put the last sentence of that passage on the screen. It says, But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God more accurately. I don't know if you've noticed this, but every time I've mentioned this couple's name, I've always said Priscilla's name first. The woman, not the man. I didn't say Aquila and Priscilla. And I've done this intentionally because this is what is done almost every time in the New Testament that this couple is mentioned. Um, particularly when their names are mentioned back-to-back like this, her name is almost always, except for maybe one other example, her name is first in the ordering. And this is important because I think that there's probably good reason why Luke put her name first. In the ancient world, the ordering of names actually mattered. And who comes first is the one who is most important. And in any couple, You're most always going to have the man coming before the woman in the ordering of those names. Even in our world today, this kind of thing still happens. And and there's actually some deeper meaning involved in the way things are ordered. But in the ancient world, it's even more important. And putting her name first likely communicates that she had a more prominent role in the early church. And in this instance, talking about teaching Apollos probably implies that she was the primary teacher of Apollos, that she is the one who was teaching him about the way of Jesus. You know, I told uh, Laura that we're kind of like Priscilla and Aquila. You know, we, we've been together so long that uh, even all the way since we were like 16. And so people like growing up, they never mentioned us really apart. It was always Laura and John, Laura and John, Laura and John. Oh, there's Laura and John. Or Laura and John coming. We always had third wheels who would hang out with us because like we just like to be around people. And, and, and we were always together. We, we spent so much time together throughout our life. Um, people don't usually talk about us separately. It's always Laura and John. And to be honest, Laura is usually mentioned first um, because she is smarter. Uh, she is cooler. Uh, she's a stronger leader and she's just more likable than me. And so everybody wants Laura around. And so I'm, I'm good with that, though, because that's, that's, the, that's the, why, the way I want it, you know. Um, church father uh, Ammonius, who was uh, from the second and third centuries, um, and other church fathers like John Chrysostom and other people have commented on this passage. But he writes this. This is all the way back in the second and third century. He, he is uh, doing his work. But he says this about Apollos. 
He said he, referring to Apollos, did not become conceited as if he were receiving a rebuke from a woman. Priscilla explained to him in her teachings the things of faith, and Apollo listened and received them, for his knowledge was imperfect. So here in the early Christianity, the second century, we have a church father highlighting the fact that a woman was teaching a man about the ways of Jesus. You can see why that these stories don't get told that often throughout history because in so many churches, they're trying to teach that women aren't allowed to teach men, yet we have examples in the early church. There is even archaeological evidence that I've been looking into this week that shows even images of women presiding over the Eucharist in these ancient images. And, And these things like they try to cover them up, right? They don't want to show off this stuff. Because people think that it's going to threaten those in power, particularly the men who have tried to keep women down in the church. But here we have in the early church a woman, Priscilla, teaching a man, leading a house church, befriending and supporting Paul. And I don't know if you see what's happening here, but she's doing things that Christian men for centuries have argued that women cannot and should not do. She is an example of someone who truly gave her life to Jesus and was willing to do whatever it took to support and equip the early church. And we would do well for ourselves to follow in her example. You know, last week, um, during our sharing time, Felice, uh, one of our members, shared a brief reflection that, that stood out to me because she was referring to, like, that the community in Acts was so important, but Acts lifts up these particular individuals throughout the book who were willing to like stand up and do something they felt was right and make a significant impact on their communities. And and often like we think, I'm just one person, right? I'm just this ordinary person. I can never make an impact. I can't make a difference. But Luke is highlighting all these individuals from Acts that are common, ordinary people who decided to do the right thing and ended up making a significant impact on others. And Priscilla and Aquila are, are examples of this. They were refugee Jews living in a foreign place in in, in the realm of the hostile Roman government empire that did not want them, yet they had the, the courage to go against the grain in the way they shared power and leadership in their own marriage, the way they lived their lives together on mission for Jesus, and they made a profound impact on the world. If Paul hadn't had this couple... I mean, I don't know if Paul could have done all that Paul did. Like, he, he said he, he, they risked their lives, or he owes his life to this couple. So I want to think about this, put ourselves in the story here a little bit. Some of you all in this room, I know, uh, would be in what you would call a Christian marriage, where both of you all are committed to Jesus. I know some of you are in marriages where maybe you are committed to Jesus and your partner's not, and that's okay. But, but some of y'all are in Christian marriages, and I want y'all to consider how your marriage resembles that of Priscilla and Aquila. Like, how do you share power and leadership within your marriage? How do you help or hinder each other in your journey as disciples of Jesus? What is your purpose and mission together as a couple? Have y'all even thought about that? Like, what has God called you to do as a couple in this world to make an impact and do something to share the love of Christ and the peace of Christ in our world? These are things we often don't spend much time thinking about, but when, when you do a Christian wedding, it says all this kind of stuff in the liturgies and the language, it's, and it's so profound and so important. And this is a couple that's actually living it out. They were disciples together, following Jesus together as a couple. Perhaps for some of you all, Priscilla's story in particular has inspired or challenged you. You know, she was the kind of person who saw needs She saw what was going around them, and she said, well, I will take responsibility for that, and I will help meet those needs. She saw friends and fellow Christians who needed support, and she didn't say, well, I guess somebody will support him. She said, no, I will do this. Paul comes in here. We'll open our home to him. We'll take care of him. She had the courage to do the right thing, and think about what kind of courage she had to have to step into these leadership roles in the early church. When I imagine there were many people around her saying, you shouldn't do this. You're not allowed to do this. You need to step down. But she had the courage to step into these roles because she knew that Jesus had called her to and the Holy Spirit had equipped her to do it. She was willing to push back against those cultural norms that said she should do something different. So how can you follow her example? Maybe you connect with Apollos in this story 
Perhaps you have a position of influence over others. And you need to be open to that feedback and correction because maybe you, you're missing. We all have blind spots. We're all missing things. Maybe you need to uh, pay attention particularly to people who often don't get heard. People whose voices try uh, to get shut out and silenced. And maybe you need to listen particularly to those folks in your life. Maybe you need to actually go and seek feedback from people you trust. I've been a part of this uh, leadership cohort thing with the denomination. And one thing I had to do was called a 360 assessment. And I had to ask all these people to, to give me feedback about my leadership. That was a really hard thing to do, actually. And they filled out this long, confusing survey uh, about me, and, and I had like 15 people do it. And then I had to go read all their comments, and, and it was good. Uh, uh, these are people I trust, and I needed to hear some of this feedback. It was really, really hard to do. And so I'm wondering, maybe uh, Apollos, he, he's an example for me. I need to continue to lean in to, to Apollos' example and be open to that kind of feedback in my own life. You know, do y'all remember I mentioned Esther a few weeks ago? Esther was way back in the Old Testament, lived, you know, a long time uh, before uh, Priscilla and Aquila. But her story is so powerful to me. She was feeling God was calling her to stand up for her people who were being hurt. And, and she felt called to stand up and do the right thing, but she was afraid. And so the word came from her where someone challenged her and said, Esther, maybe God has put you in this position you're in. For such a time as this. Maybe God has raised you up for such a time as this. To look around you. To see the needs around you. To see the people in your life. To see the things that you see that are not right around you in your own community or family or, or workplace. Maybe you need to follow Priscilla's example and, and ask God how you might stand up. And, and take a risk and seek to make a difference. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.